Hey, everybody, welcome back. We have an amazing episode coming your way. First up, we're joined by our pals. We haven't seen them in weeks, Vinny and Sunny, for another edition of the Crypto Roundtable. We chop it up about the government crackdown on the crypto sector. We also have a very in-depth discussion on which agencies should regulate crypto and how. Then producer Rachel is joined by Prince Ghosh, the co-founder and CEO of Factored Quality, which offers software and managed services to help book trained quality control inspectors to inspect goods. Yes, she found a Gen Z startup founder working on quality assurance. It's going to be a great show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub helps all founders build a better startup at a lower cost from day one. Startups get $150,000 in Azure credits, access to OpenAI APIs, free dev tools like GitHub, technical advisory, access to mentors and experts, and so much more. There is no funding requirement, and it only takes minutes to join. Sign up today at aka.ms slash This Week in Startups. Merge, let your developers get back to their core product. Merge is a single API to add hundreds of integrations to your app. Integrate up to five customers for free today at merge.dev slash twist. And pilot.com. Pilot takes care of your bookkeeping from start to finish, so you can focus 100% on making your business succeed. Go to pilot.com slash twist for 20% off your first six months of Pilot Core. Okay, everybody, it's Wednesday. It's been far too long, Molly. So long. I barely so recognize long. these guys. <laughs> okay. Let's get started, Molly. Let's do Let's it. We are back with the crypto okay. roundtable at long last, maybe our last one because the industry is about to get smothered <laughs> like a baby little flame in the woods, snow falling oh. on it. No, um, there seems to be a, a crackdown. It seems like mm. maybe the story of 2023 is going to be the crypto crackdown. And so we got our experts back to talk to us about it. Sunny Madra, co-founder of Definitive Intelligence and Vinny Lingham, co-founder of Civic and wait room for one-on-one -on -one video conferencing because running two companies at the mm. same time is just the thing to do. It's just what you do these days. Well, I'm, I'm technically just chairman of Civic at the moment, so oh, I'm not, okay. uh, not running it operationally. But thank <laughs> All you. All right, listen, it's been a long time since you've been here. I think uh, we took a little break because uh, everybody's been busy, the holidays, yada, yada. But we woke up last week and there was somebody who said like a week ago, and I think this was in one of our group chats. I don't know if it was in our poker group chat, Sandeep, uh, Mr. Madra, or if it was in our twist one or the crypto one, but somebody like a rando is like, I hear there's going to be a bunch of crypto SEC actions. Mm -hmm. And then sure enough, next day, next couple of days, we saw some crackdowns. So I think we need to unpack that. Did you see this coming, Sandeep? Well, yeah, I mean, look, the one thing let's level set as we get into this conversation, right? Because, um, you know, you're dancing on the grave a bit early here, Jay Cal. And, uh, <laughs> I don't want to dance on the grave. I'll yeah. explain my position in a moment. But like, let, let's kind of frame it, at least the framework that I use is like blockchain technologies, say Web3 applications, and then cryptocurrencies, right? And what we're seeing now is a lot of regulation coming around cryptocurrencies, but blockchain technologies and Web3 applications are you know not getting looped into that so like i think we should just keep those things separate because i think a, a lot of it gets looped together and then i think you know that doesn't help the folks that are really innovating in the industry right now well, well let's also just like define like the the roles of the government agencies right so the the sec is claiming jurisdiction over basically all of crypto at this point um cryptocurrencies which, Vinny. Cryptocurrencies. cryptocurrencies yeah cryptocurrencies right, right. so the, the cftc says that they have bitcoins under their jurisdiction because it's a commodity um you, you, you have, I mean, we have, a, first of all, a jurisdictional battle, and potentially, there's, I think there should be a separate agency, but that's just, you know, I think there should be a digital assets agency that gets created, but that's a separate view. And I, I think that, that trying to get these agencies to, you know, they still have to go to court and fight this, and the SEC has lost a couple of battles in court already, uh, you know, uh, in the cryptocurrency world. So it's not fair to complete that the SEC has, you know, uh, jurisdiction and that if people are breaking the law or are breaking law, that, that the, the SEC has the right to enforce uh, action against them. So they can be challenged. And, and Coinbase has made it very clear that they're going to go and fight in court. And I think others will do the same. Circle will do the same, et cetera. So, you know, when you say there's a regulatory crackdown, I agree 
I think that it's debatable which agency leads the crack, so-called crackdown, but I think we are going to see, you know, um, governments around the world crack down a lot more on crypto uh, in general. The flip side is governments can never coordinate anything. So they, they, they can't really, you know, coordinate attacks between different governments and some jurisdictions will be friendly towards crypto. Others won't be. Um, so this is not going to play out over three months, JK, or six months. This is like five years, like the next two administrations at the US level and, and probably other parts of the world. And so in that time, I think crypto has a, a path to you know, escape velocity where, you know, like Bitcoin, no government can actually shut down Bitcoin, even if they wanted to. They can shut down the gateways. So you can say, well, we won't allow money transfers from banking into Bitcoin, they can try and depress the price that way. But in a long enough, on a long enough time frame, um, the, the decentralized cryptocurrencies will be outside the purview of governments because you can't stop it. Okay, just right. a level set here. I loved your definition, Sandeep. There's the Web3 application level, there are cryptocurrencies, and then there's the blockchain. I don't think we need to define those things. Everybody understands what you're talking about on this week in startups. If you don't, you can look up cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and uh, just a Web3 definition. I don't think that requires uh, any uh, definition uh, on a show of this level of sophistication. However, Molly, uh, being the expert you are on all things finance, uh, perhaps you could catch us up on the mandate of CFTC yeah. and so SEC have- and the difference between those two to, to then catch us up on Vinny's position that, hey, which agency should be involved in this? Who do we call? Right. Which is a great and that's a outstanding question right it's sort of how a lot of times you might see like volleyball nobody calls the ball between the fcc and the ftc right and those mandates might overlap and in this case you have these two agencies the cftc which is really all about uh the trading it's this relatively new federal agency that deals with derivatives markets futures contracts options and swaps then you have the sec which is all about protecting investors, maintaining efficient markets, facilitating capital formation. And both of them seem to sort of fundamentally be saying, and possibly rightly, we have, possibly, we have some reason to come in here. There are aspects of the cryptocurrency universe writ large that are 100% about swapping and derivatives and futures and the kind of financialization that we've talked about in this show for a year now. And you have the SEC saying, these are pretty clearly investment vehicles in some cases. We are going to classify them as securities because they seem to follow all those rules. So I guess what you're saying, Vinny, is maybe like both have jurisdiction or none, or this could get delayed, this sort of idea of enforcement as these two agencies like fight it out. Before we do that, Mike, we back for a second and maybe just, I think we have in the notes the mission statement of each one or maybe in the Mm -hmm. the Slack. Can you just read those so that we just level set with the audience? Because they hear SEC. SEC, they think they know what that is. They hear CFTC. And I, I couldn't read you off the top of my head the mission statements, but I think it's important to take from yeah. their website exactly what they said. Yes. The Securities and Exchange Commission has a three-part mission, protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. Got it. The mission of the FTC is to promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. Got it. Okay, it's pretty clear. And then okay. their mandate is, according to Investopedia, they're the federal agency the, that regulates derivatives markets specifically. Got it. Yeah. Doing more with less is more important than ever. You know this, especially for startup founders. We all have to be efficient. And if you're running a startup, I want you to know about the Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. It's a no-brainer. They're going to help you scale efficiently while preserving your runway. How are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do it with the best startup program I think we've ever seen. Up to $150,000 in Azure credits, plus access to OpenAI's APIs. Think about that. As well as the new Azure OpenAI service. And listen, there's other things that Microsoft has available to you as part of this program. How about free access to GitHub and Visual Studio? How about one-to-one technical advisory and expert help on topics like product, fundraising, and go-to-market? How about access to a network of mentors that are plugged into the startup world, plus free access to partners like LinkedIn and Bubble, which can help you build your MVP even quicker? Microsoft, so generous. The Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub is open to everyone. 
Whether you're in the idea phase or you're further along, there's no funding or requirement. They want any founder to be able to get access because they want all founders to succeed. It's really a no brainer. It takes five minutes to apply and startups can get massive benefits immediately. Go to sign up right now. Let's take a pause and write this down, everybody. AKA.ms slash this week in startups. Like I said, most generous program I think we've ever seen on this podcast. AKA.ms slash this week in startups. Thanks again, Microsoft. All right. So that's what they say on their website. So Vinny, when you look at those two things, uh, to, to Molly's question, like, how do you interpret where specifically staking? Because that is the action we saw this week is the act of staking. Where would staking fit for you here? And why? So this, this is why, uh, first of all, I don't believe that um, two agencies can have jurisdiction. I need to, like, because then who takes enforcement action when there is action? So I do think that that's, that's a conflict. Um, I think that that staking is should be defined into an entirely different um this is why i think there's a, we're missing an agency we're missing a digital assets agency or something okay um and mm-hmm. and i think that, that that if you think about what is staking right i own some solana and uh, i go put it into a, a smart contract and people who need to use that solana pay me some sort of a return for using it um you know whether it's uh, well, if you do native staking with the network then, then, then I'm saying I trust a certain validator and I will get um, uh, rewards back from the network as they print. So I get a share of the rewards, which is very predictable. There's no, and it's not dollar denominated. I'm getting it in the actual currency that I'm staking. And then obviously you get different, different types of staking. That's just Solana, but different types of staking, which you get paid a reward, a certain rate of return um, for it. The, 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 the quest, I mean, like the ACC, I see their point. This is a, a way of making money, so to speak, but it's not money. It's not US dollars. No one's promising me a return dollars. It's fixed in the unit of, of cryptocurrency I'm getting. So it's like, you know, I go buy seeds at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, um, a plant store. I plant a tree and it gives me apples, right? Uh, and then I take those seeds again and I go replant them and give apples. Like, it, it, like, you know, it's, I'm not getting dollars of growing off trees. I'm growing apples. So, so your argument there and your definition of staking is you put something in, you get more of it back. Sometimes it's transformed. We do, we do know that happens sometimes. It throws off some new currency or token, but it's not currency, even though people paid currency to get it. Sonny, how do you define staking? And, and so let, just me just add, let me just add to one second. I, like I'll, I'll be even more like, but more finer point to it. If the returns are dollar denominated or any uh, fiat currency denominated, I think that's within the jurisdiction of the SEC. If the okay. returns, if the returns are not denominated in the fiscal currency of a country or of a sovereign region, and it's denominated in the underlying asset um, rewards, like Bitcoin, for example, as well as if you're a miner, you're earning Bitcoin. Um, I don't think that's under the jurisdiction of any government because if, if I go and put in my, you know X amount of my asset to earn a bit more of that asset, it's like me having a, a you know a sheep and okay. the sheep has a has a baby, right? Like got it. Okay, you, yeah. it's a great analogy. I think we understand it. Sonny, maybe you could try defining staking for the audience. Explain staking, what it is, and maybe why the SEC is taking these actions against stakers. Yeah, I, or maybe I really just like, define it. Just define staker, yeah, staking. Oh, well, I, I, I like Vinny's description of it, right? I think the core of staking comes back around to these are you know meant to be decentralized networks, and these networks operate with their you know um, their currency, their own currency. And how that economy works is by, um, especially when you move away uh, uh, to less energy intensive um, um, blockchains, those things require like a trust system. And part of that <coughs> trust system is, um, you know, for there to be staked, um, um, staked currencies that are in, in, in it. It's just sort of, it's how these, sorry, I'm just kind of, uh, I really like Vinny's explanation. I'm just trying to expand it. It's like, we want to have these decentralized networks that aren't owned by anyone, right? We've debated why, right? They can be composable, like they can run forever. There's no one person responsible for them. And so in order for that to work, you need kind of staking as part of the underlying system for the blockchains to work. Um, and so that's mm-hmm. really the, where, where it comes from. And the return is related to, you know, people are using their computers, right? And the resources that come from that. And so I think what's happened is though, people have taken that and, expanded beyond it and that's when it's gone you know similar to what we talked about before what happened with that gbtc trade right people have gone in there and it it starts to kind of become the core of other things and so i think that's the danger in my opinion right it's 
This Go has ahead. been, and this was a, a pretty big action that we saw last week over the past few days ish, which was that Kraken was fined for this staking as a service product because you had staking and then you had staking pools. And this is where not only is Gary Gensler and the SEC, you know, not only are they wading in with fines, they're actually like trying to do some education around this. So we pulled up this video um, of Gary Gensler chiming in on Twitter about why the SEC is banning staking. Here's the rub. When a company or platform offers you these kinds of returns, whether they call their services lending, earn, rewards, APY, or staking, that relationship should come with the protections of the federal securities laws. That means you, the investor, should receive important disclosures. For example, what do they actually do with your tokens? Are they really staking them? Are they lending, borrowing, or trading with them? Are they commingling them with their other businesses? Where do the rewards come from? Are you getting your fair share? Are the underlying crypto protocols genuinely creating value on your investment? Or are they just new tokens that dilute the value of ones you already have? Remember, if you have a stake, that's S-T-E-A-K. If you have a stake meant for two and cut it into three pieces, it's still the same amount of stake. Unfortunately, because these staking as a service providers generally are not providing proper disclosures, there's currently no reliable way as an investor to know the answers to these important investment questions. Plus, when you sign on the dotted line or accept the terms of service, you are generally agreeing that placing your tokens with these providers may mean transferring your ownership to them. There's an expression in crypto, not your keys, not your crypto. You see, you're basically an investor in their platform. If it goes under, and we've seen plenty of that recently, you end up in line in the bankruptcy court. That's why it's so important that these companies and platforms comply with the securities law. After all, the securities laws, regardless of what you think of stake or staking, they're good for investors. All right, so uh, give us here. So this enforcement yeah. action was also seen as putting Coinbase on notice, side note. And then what do you think is in here? I'll start with Sunny. That is fair or not fair or both. I, uh, you know what? Uh, I hadn't seen that one before. I actually liked it. I think, you know, he in, talks yeah. about the core issue. Look, the staking technology was fundamentally part of what, you know, makes blockchains work, right? And it's been used, it's been turned into something else and people are using it. Uh, and you saw the description, whether it's earn, APY, and those, that wasn't what it was originally meant for. People mm -hmm. package it up, staking as a service. And then when you're doing that, all, I think you touched on, I, I really liked the video. I mean, I, I thought it was yeah, accurate. I you touched on all the key terms. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, I, I, haven't seen, I, haven't, I haven't seen it either. And I, I actually agree with Sonny. Um, I think it's accurate. I, I think the, the, here's the issue, right? The issue is that the SEC can and should regulate uh, Coinbase, Kraken, uh, et cetera. And Kraken could have gone and fought the fine as well. They didn't have to accept it. They should, they should regulate it because these services are providing a layer on top of staking, right? They're creating pools. They, they, you know, they, they're taking custody of funds. That is, all, that is all within the jurisdiction. I mean, these are regular entities. They should be under the jurisdiction. My argument is not uh, that they shouldn't. My argument is that the, the, the rules should be set that if you are taking this money in, if you're enabling pools or you're enabling it, but, but you're not taking custody of the funds per se, you're enabling like a multi-sig contract. Th that's fine. The moment you take custody and you're paying out APY and you're taking um, you know, some cut, there should be, you know, as a service provider, the, the, you know, within the framework of the law, there be sh sh should be some rule set. The corollary of that is, if I go directly to the Solana network and I go stake my coins with the validator, uh, the SEC should have nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with them if I'm going directly. And I think that's what Genza is actually saying. He's actually, he's going after the providers of these staking yeah. services. Not the, not the notion of staking itself. That's my right. read. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's true. I think it's a, a, a pretty nuanced and good take. Jason, what are your thoughts? 
Finally, the SEC is proactively uh, educating and discussing very complex issues with the American public. This is fantastic. So mm -hmm. I am very pleased to see the two OG crypto uh, peeps that we have here, Mr. Madra and Mr. Lingham, uh, saying they like this video. I think that this is what the SEC needs to do. This is targeted at consumers. So although it's a little goofy cutting the steak into three pieces and using a stock image, you know, and making it like a TikTok video, well, that's how I love people it. consume. And those are the people who are attracted to this. And the SEC is meeting consumers where they are. We said before, hey, what is the mandate of the SEC? And you read, Molly, from their website, protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. Now, the last one is about you know uh what we do for a living making venture firms and syndicates and stuff like that let's put that aside but a, a fair orderly and efficient market means hey people need to be educated and protecting investors people need to be educated they need to understand it and it's delightful for me to hear our ogs here our crypto ogs say yeah that's what we need to do now does it need a new agency i think it needs an agency to do new things we don't need a new agency. We need an agency to do new things. And the new things this agency needs to do is sit down with crypto people and say, tell us everything. And how would you like to proceed? And then say, here is how we already do this. We can only make so many changes to this because there's this Congress and, you know, the public, and they get to vote on things and they get to have a say here. So we can make some changes. But generally speaking, you're going to have to play by this rule book and this rule book changes slowly. Listen, it's 2023. Closing business to business deals is going to be harder this year. You know this to be true because companies, hey, they're tightening their belt. It's the year of austerity and it's the year of focus. The last thing you want to do is slow your sales team down with a lack of integrations, right? These days, business to business buyers expect integrations. We expect our people management tool to work seamlessly with our payroll provider. We expect our CRM to work seamlessly with our accounting software. If it doesn't, it's a huge issue. But when you start a company, integrations are brutally hard. They take a ton of time, but Merge makes them way easier. Merge is the leading unified API that allows you to launch integrations in days, not quarters. Think about that. All of these integrations are out there. What if you could just have, boom, over 150 different integrations across five different categories, human resources, information systems, ticketing, it's all just built into Merge so your developers can get back to working on the important parts of your product. Merge is the leading unified API that allows you to launch integrations in days, not quarters. That's all you need to know. So here is your call to action. Merge has unlimited integrations and they charge based on how many of your customers use these integrations. So here's what they're going to do. They're going to give you five linked accounts for free today at merge.dev slash twist. Again, five linked accounts for free. There's just no cost to you. Free. You know what the word free means? Free. M-E-R-G-E dot dev slash twist. I've been sitting here and I, a lot of this comes to my own personal jealousy of crypto. And I will put that out there absolutely honestly. I am incredibly jealous that capital formation for crypto companies can be done with anonymity, with global scale, with absolutely no fees. It's extraordinary what crypto has built. And I would like to deploy that at the syndicate.com to invest in companies. I would love for everybody to send me a fraction of a Satoshi and ETH, some garbage NFT, whatever. I don't care how they get the money in. And I could have a million people put in a dollar each and then put a million into a startup. That is my ultimate dream. The SEC is a blocker. I can't do that. I can't ask a thousand, a million people for one dollar without doing a, a, you know, a crazy, but, but, yeah. a, a crazy SEC public filing. But the two crypto people we have on right now could have that up and running in under 30 days, probably in a week. Yeah. And so I mean, uh, the potential the, uh, here is so great. That yeah, they did that, right? The Constitution. Dow's have example. done it. Yeah. And well, DAOs clearly that really fall under yeah, SEC facilitate money. capital formation. But so that, that yeah. is my, my, but, but, my, but bitter, my personal bitterness. And so I've given this some thought. I'm very bitter that I can't do this kind of stuff. And I am unable to break the rules at scale because I have people who work for me. I have a family. I can't just go out there and break these rules and stick it to the SEC. I, I, I want to continue to be free and not in jail. But I, I w I'm actually considering when I watch this, like, Maybe I should move to the Zug, 
<laughs> wherever the hell that is, <laughs> and I should just YOLO it and just not yeah. take Americans' money and put this offshore. So the existing agencies, the old dogs need to learn new tricks. That's my position on it. I'm putting my cards out there. You can clip this. You can aggregate it. You can make a TikTok and dunk on me. I'm jealous. I want to see this vision occur, and I want the SEC to proactively engage this group, and I want this group to stop stealing from people. But, but, I but think so. So, Jason, I, th I think it's a you have to be a little, little like let us be a little bit more intellectually honest here, right? Let's so, do it. Okay, I'm here for so, it. So, 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 I'll ask you the questions. So, so why do you want to have a big fund and do capital formation with so many people? Why do I want to have a capital formation with so many people? Yeah. Oh, it's it's actually it's, that's such a great question. Um, we could fund more companies that uh, do take more risky bets. Okay. And do it with less cost, less time, and the people who make the bets would have less um, problems. Uh, they would have less damage if it doesn't work. And the majority of startups don't work. We would say 80% at the seed incubator stage don't work. So what if we made it 90% don't work? Well, if people are putting in 50K each, that hurts. It can sting. And they're accredited investors. You get 20 of them for 50K. It would be much better to have 1,000 for 1,000, 10,000 for 100, 100,000 for 10, or a million for a dollar. But the problem is speed. When we do this, we have to have people sign documents. We have to have them wire money. The wiring costs are greater, Vinny, than the costs <laughs> that they're investing. So we set a $4,000 minimum for the syndicate just because doing the tax documents for 10 years is so arduous that 250 people versus 50 people in the tax documents makes a difference. Uh, and collecting 250 signatures versus 50 is obviously one fifth. So it, it's just the, the speed. And then also for the investors, more people could participate. Uh, and that would be more fair. So that I have that reason as well. Great question. So, so, so as you as you're going through this thinking, you know, your argument really is that you can spread the risk uh, yes. across a wider base. Do you think yep. you'd raise more money than what you can raise currently? You know, there is a gating factor, which is how much money the startup wants to take in. Uh, and so we wouldn't want to flood a startup with $10 million at a $100 million valuation at that stage. Let's say the company has... No, no, no. I mean, I'm saying the fund, the fund that you're running, right? Or, or, I, I or, think or are you more SPVing? Are you saying more from an SPV perspective? From an SPV perspective or even okay. a fund formation perspective, um, sure, we could have more people participate in funds. Um, but it, just from it, let's just stick to the SPV concept, like one deal at a time, more people could participate, we wouldn't have to exclude 95% of the people in the United States, and we wouldn't have to exclude, you know, whatever percent it is on a global basis. And then that could make more people move up from poor to middle class, middle class to rich, rich to, you know, the rich don't have a problem, they have access already. I, 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 I struggle, a bit, I struggle a bit with this, Jason, because I think one of the things I've learned as an angel investor is, like you know, making lots of like 10k 25k bets you you know you got you get like hundreds of these companies in your portfolio that you spread out the administrative costs following out, i mean you don't keep track anymore at, at this point like when you're in the sort of high net with individual you, you just actually forget about it you write the check you, if it comes back fine otherwise yeah. like you don't track it you don't monitor it the ones that do come back if you're lucky it's a 10x you know yeah. and then it doesn't it doesn't really move the dial or 3000 x so, yeah, well, so you get a couple of those. That's great. Like no, a you get one in a lifetime. I think you get one in yeah. a lifetime if you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you get a couple. <laughs> but but um, four thousand. Yeah, who's counting? I, I, I guess. I guess. I guess the point is, what, what, you know, you need to take enough of those bets for that three thousand to come along. Okay. And sure, the, it's a risky bet, which means you could, even more reason people should spend just ten bucks or a hundred bucks making exactly. It. Like no, let's say I made, no. I can make ten thousand of those at two dollars each or one dollar each throughout a year. And it becomes incremental. We're like he's. We're not talking about high net worth no, no, individuals I, making no, no, these bets. I get, I, I'm a big fan of of crowdsource capital. I'm a big fan of opening it up for people. My, yeah, my, that's really my, the my, issue. It's just yeah, if yeah. they choose to, they have access. Sonny, what do you think? But but, You've been but, now, they have to, but now they have to trade. They have to trust you as a picker. Yes, and that's the great thing. You then would pick the fund managers. Their fund managers yeah. would have their track records. They, you know, you would get to choose. Hey, I trust Jason. I trust Molly. I don't trust this person. I don't trust that person. And they write a good deal memo and they keep me up to date on it. You are outsourcing the management of that investment. Um, just like when you're buying Netflix stock, you're saying, hey, I trust this management team. But Sonny, what, do you, what are your thoughts yeah, on this? Yeah. And, and my confession of my jealousy <laughs> and well, I mean, uh, that, the overall reaction here that, to that, this action. I'm, I'm, I'm still processing. Well, look, look, um, we have systems in place to collect lots of small amounts of money from folks, lottery tickets. 
right? That infrastructure hmm. exists. It runs multiple times a week. Sometimes you can nice. 700 million X your money. Right? Hot take coming can, in. Right? I love so, it. Um, you know, the systems exist to do it. I think the structures that are, yeah, no one is, you know, protected from buying lottery tickets, right? Like you can buy one, you can buy a thousand dollars a day every time. Um, so I, I kind of feel like there's a philosophical conversation that has been kind of layered out within society that has us in this spot because it's okay, if, you know, when the Powerball goes to, you know, whatever, hundred, seven, couple hundred million or billion, it's been a few times, right? No one stops people from buying, whether it's $1, $10, or $1,000, right? And the odds of return there are really bad, you know, right? Like, you know, and what do you learn? Mm-hmm. Nothing. And so nothing. I think there's like some societal constructs here that are really, you know, are holding people back. And it's less about the technology or anything else because we, we enable it in other places. And so that's it's that. so interesting that you say that because we are also in the midst of throwing open the barn doors on sports betting. In the United yeah. States, which is a very similar, oh, great point. I mean, right? If it's all just gambling, Nick, now we're saying like, yeah, you can bet all you want. I mean, the truth is that finance is always gate kept finance. And that is why Bitcoin was conceived, right? It was to like tear down these walls, like barbarians at the gate enough with this. And then to get back to the SEC and kind of this enforcement question, the old demons of finance co-opted a lot of this and i would argue the sec doesn't actually need to learn that many new tricks because what they're talking about now is protecting investors that cftc is talking about derivative swapping like once the tools of finance were applied then it seems to me that the old gatekeepers of finance 100 percent apply here they 100 percent have jurisdiction the question is what can survive and what should survive of the original vision, like your point, Vinny, right? If you stake one Solana, one soul, fine. Nobody cares. I don't even think Kensler cares. I think it was like pretty clear from his video that he's like, I don't care. It's when you financialize this thing that you may run afoul of traditional finance gatekeepers. And also we should probably acknowledge that I'm sure banks still don't want this to exist. So like, is the mission of enforcement that could mm, be 100% cynical. legit going to mm. get wrapped up in this idea that like the gatekeepers ideally would love to strangle Bitcoin in the crib. This is why I got to get Brian Armstrong back on the on here because this is a very calm discussion. This got a little to? heated. Yeah, exactly. No, I do. I, I like, I'm a fan of Brian's. I have a, I'm a fan uh, oh, no, of saying, Jeremy Does he want to come on? Because he seems I mad think at so. you now. I think so. Yeah. I think he'd prefer to come on all in. Um, I don't think he wants to face me alone. Um, in all cases, he actually came on the podcast before they were public. And then after they were public, he asked to come on all in, all in past. Um, you know, we don't really do guests all the time. I, I said, hey, come on this week. Sorry, but then he passed on that. So I was like, all right, you know what? And, you know, and then he decides he's going to dunk on me. So I don't think he, I don't think Brian, and I'm just, I'll say this directly to him. I don't think he wants to have a hard discussion one-on-one with me. Hmm. I think he wants to, you know, have it with the other three besties there. So he doesn't have to face my level of criticism. Um, and, you know, he, he, he then uh, pull up the tweet just from Brian, not mine, please. Um, he decides when I say like, hey, you know, crypto needs to play by the rules. He's like disappointing to see you duped by this, Jason. There is no way for crypto firms to come in and register. It was fake. The SEC's own commissioner, uh, Hester Pierce, who's been on this week in startups is great. Uh, she's very well spoken, essentially confirms this. So I'm like, come on, man, you don't need to dunk on me and tell me I'm getting duped. Did you guys see this thread with me and Brian, by the way? I don't yeah, know if you yeah, saw it. So I go down, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I said to him, listen, here's the facts. Crypto firms made up a new securities framework and ignored the rules. I believe that's true. Web3 startups and their VCs swept mountains of cash off the table from uninformed civilians. I believe that's a fact. And the SEC is here to protect civilians and many crypto firms <laughs> around. So they, f- they forced their hand <laughs> around. Sorry, uh, find out. So yeah, we got, got a little heated. Got a little heated. Is What's fair about Brian's position? Right. I guess is the question, Molly. What, what do you think? Molly, yeah. I'm curious. I mean, does he have to take this position on some level? Because this question of enforcement of exchanges and pooled staking is more existential for Coinbase. It's 11% of their revenue. Somebody tweeted, I don't know if that's the exact number, but it's some double digit percentage of their revenue. So I understand that. And he's frustrated because he tried to go to the SEC. Remember that a couple of years ago, he 
tried to meet with them, they refused to meet with them, or they canceled the meeting. So what, what's fair about what, what do you think of the exchange overall, Sandeep? And then I'll go to you, Vinny, because well, I yeah, see you're ready to go, to go to. Frame, I'm going to go back to the framework we started with, right? I, I, you know, I think the challenge is, you know, if you look back the origins of Coinbase, it was to buy Bitcoin, which is, you know, turned into like a, 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 a stable asset, right? Not, not in the right way of like stable coins, but like a, at scale all over the world. The challenge is, you know, every time I go in the Coinbase app, they're promoting all kinds of different financialization of, you know, whether it's a staking product, an APY product, they're promoting, um, you know, going back to your point, Jason, they're promoting random tokens that, you know, are, we don't know the depth of like how, the, how much work the project has done, you know, what, what really exists. And so um, from, from that perspective, I'm not a fan of that stance, right? Because, you know, they're sort of driving the casino of cryptocurrencies and, um, and they, you know, and that leads to kind of, Gary's point in that video is that when people are doing that and then, you know, they go under and you've either trusted them with giving your assets to them and they've staked it and done something with it, or they've promoted you buying. So you believe you should be regulated. Insurance. You yes. believe, and, and you believe that as well, Vinny, if you start, if you're doing this formally like this, it's not a distributed project where you're getting, you know, more baby pigs for the big pigs you put into the pool or baby sheep. Interesting. I, can we Interesting. I don't know exactly how to go. I put 10 <laughs> rabbits in. I no, got a bunch no, of bunnies I, I, I out. Think, I made paella, I think rabbit I paella. Think I think protocols, so, so there's a couple of things the regulation should cover, right? Okay. So the, the, the issuance of the tokens, there should okay. be some regulations around it. Mm -hmm. it you know, if, for example, if it's just a mined token, then it's mined, right? So if you want to just connect commodity hardware mind or token like a mind yeah. token you yeah, use yeah. you did some compute like bitcoin is mined yeah yeah, yeah exactly so you mine it so the, the, by the way there's already a, there's already a framework for this right now like if you launch a cryptocurrency you, and you even if it's a mine token like a, a solana or whatever else um or a stake token um if you have a sale, you can do a, a SAFT to accredited investors. You can place those tokens with them. There probably should be some more clarity on like what they can do with it and how they can do with it, how they how, how they can you know sell it, etc. But that needs some more clarity. But that that's already fine. Um, I think the moment you get into the world of uh, service providers, on top of the protocol, that's where there's some regulations needed. But if I, as a consumer, want to go and buy a token because I think that, you know, um, I think that a certain token, whether it's Render or Filecoin or Solana or whatever is, is you know, I, I, I like it, I want, I'll get behind the project, and then I stake it and I earn more of those tokens, that's, just, I mean, that's a long-term investment for me, right? So if I say I'm going to go buy um, a, th a thousand Filecoin and I'm going to stake it and in five years' time or 10 years' time, I'll have 1,300 Filecoin um, and I'm doing it with the network natively, that should be like my decision because like if I'm going to hold it anyway, I might as well get some sort of yield or return on it. Now, the, the issue really is when you have these service providers in the middle, now they're taking a cut. Now, you know, now, now they're also promising you to juice up the returns. Potentially, they, they're doing funny stuff like um, leveraging your tokens. They're taking custody of it. Like Gary said very clearly, not your keys, not your crypto. And I've always been a fan of that, that, of that saying. So mm -hmm. it, it's really, Jason, it's, it's, it's so nuanced, okay? But, but I think we have to understand, like, the, 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 it's the initial, the ICO, the initial issuance, it's the protocol itself, it's the service providers. I actually understand they're very and then, reasonable, and then, reasonable yeah. position. I yeah. think, I Molly, think this is a reasonable be, position. I think so we what might do, what all you, agree, even Gary. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, so what, it, what is causing <laughs> this riff here, Molly? What, if you were to look at this, why is this so contentious right now in your mind, you know, just sort of looking at the field? Why do you think it's gotten to this point of contentiousness? I, I mean, I have my own theories. I'm sure the boys do too here, but yeah, I'm I mean, your I'm not going to lie. As an like, outsider as well, and, and looking, I really in. like your tweet about the arrogance. <laughs> like, ah, okay, no, no, no doubt about it. Like it has become, unfortunately, a little too easy to dislike Crypto Bros, present company excluded, because mm. of this kind of sense of superiority and like you're all fools, and you know we're all getting rich Got without it. you. And I will confess to that kind of jealousy as well, especially after having lost my $300 worth of Bitcoin at $1 each. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not. You would have I'm liked not, some regulation in your not, exchange not to keep those Bitcoins. Yes. I would have liked yeah. an FDIC to be yeah. behind Got my it. purchase. Um, what consumer wouldn't? However, I think the reason this is so contentious is just because it looks like traditional banking. And it's all this, and then it's going to be, and it's so 
hard. Mm. Like Vinny, the thing you're hundred percent right about in terms of regulators is that they have not historically been good at scalpel surgery. It's like, nuanced. Yeah. It is really, really nuanced because what we have here is sort of multiple entities within the host and we have to carve out some and leave the others and not kill the host. And yes. that is not a skill set. Like these guys are not good at whatever that old surgeon game is. That's not a skill set that regulators have. And I think there's probably a very reasonable fear that they're going to come in and just be like radiation, just like nuke the whole thing. So, and that'll be the end of it. And and I think Gary Gensler is presenting right now the position that he wants a scalpel approach, but it sounds like there's just not a lot of trust. Hmm. All right, everybody, I'm here with Asim Daher. He is the CEO and founder of Pilot. You guys know Pilot. They help everybody with their accounting, CFO, and tax services. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. A lot of talk about burn rate. How can a startup uh, in this kind of climate reduce their burn and extend their run? Yeah, it's a great question. So burn ultimately, or increasing cash in your bank account, is a consequence of four basic levers. The first is revenue. Can you sell more to your new customers or existing customers? Can you raise prices? Can you do things that actually increase the amount of revenue you take in? The second is gross margin. Can you reduce the cost of providing your service so the same customers generate more cash for you? The third is payment terms. Can you get folks to prepay you annually? Maybe can you negotiate more flexibility with your own vendors? And the fourth, of course, is just decreasing costs. Are there expenses you can reduce or cancel? Are there investments you could defer until subsequent years? Yeah, great advice. And you got to look at all four of these things. And man, sometimes a customer can pay a little bit more and founders are scared of raising their prices. And sometimes they're lowering their prices when they should be, in fact, raising them because they're providing more value. So really think that through. Not just cutting costs, but also maybe look at how much you're charging. Maybe it's time to increase it a little bit. Great job. All right, listen, if you're a Twist listener, you can get 20% off for the first six months of doing your accounting with Pilot, pilot.com slash twist. That's pilot.com slash twist for 20% off the first six months. So let's look at Celsius for a second, right? Like Celsius was the poster child. It is the poster child of like, you know, effectively, uh, I guess in some ways, staking is a little Celsius token thing and uh, and how they were promising ridiculous APY rewards, etc. Like, yeah. And, and most of these rewards are actually denominated in dollars. There's, they were promising like dollar-based returns. So this is, goes on to the stablecoin discussion, right? Um, stablecoins should be re regulated. Returns Why on stablecoins. Why should stablecoins... Stable okay, th this is one I, I... I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this is one I really want to understand. I got your position on staking. If it's uh, decentralized and I'm getting back, you know, puppies for having put these beautiful English bulldogs in, I get it. It's no cash. There's no APY. There's no central control you didn't take custody great you didn't take my bulldogs that just magically appeared on the blockchain stable coins are one for one and the howey test says like hey it's some group thing and there's some expectation of gain with the stable coin there's no expectation of gain so explain why stable coins i happen to agree that they should be regulated but i'm curious your position on why should stable coins be regulated because people were also upset about that because i think the sec came out and said hey we're gonna make sure stable coins it's are also the, it's the word stable right the the yeah. notion that is being put out there is that you know there's a it's a one for one and in, in the case of you know usdc and circle they publish sort of their holdings and they make it very clear in the case of some of the other tokens some which we saw go to zero which we didn't share that the stable wasn't really stable it was like either algorithmically stable or the underlying assets haven't been disclosed and i think that's that goes back to the you know the financialization discussion right that's like the the what's being and gary said that in the video what people are being told does that line up to what is actually happening and i think that's what you get with some of the regulation is the transparency you know if, if everyone uh, along you know say the last few years knew that the apys that were being offered were really just coming from an arb that existed down in that gbtc thing that we spoke about a few times maybe mm -hmm. you wouldn't have put your money there Right. And it was that yeah. clear in the documents. I, I haven't gone through them in detail to even know if that exists. Did, did, you lose, if, did, did you lose any money in that, Sonny? Did you lose any money in that? In, in the whole debacle? The I APY? Mean, I, I, no, I, I've never, not, not there, but like I had money at FTX. So technically, okay. yes, but like yeah, not, yeah. Not, a, not a huge amount or anything. But, um, but, and, and, uh, yeah. and I had invested in FTX, right? I think you did too. So, um, well, I think I, I, they acquired a company I invested in, so I, <laughs> I didn't technically make the decision to invest in uh -huh. them. But the reason I asked the question, yeah. Sunny, is of you is that 
you'll find a lot of the OGs, myself, Sunny, and other people, we, I didn't get hit by Luna. I didn't get yeah. hit by Celsius. No. I didn't get hit by any of this stuff. In fact, I didn't, I didn't even get hit by the FTX because I never traded on them because I didn't trust him in the first place. So, yeah. uh, you know, like, w we know when something looks and smells fishy because we've been around for a long time. And most of my OG friends were affected. It was the newbies that got affected by all these, like, right. promises of these ridiculous gains. And, and so to answer your question, Jason, why I think stable coins need to be regulated. And let's just make sure that, you know, for the audience, there's two different types of stable coins. There's algorithmic ones, and then there's uh, asset-backed ones, okay? And assets can be cash or bonds or whatever else. In the, and I'll, I'll, I'll dismiss the algorithmic one for a second quickly, because Luna was an algorithmic one, but the Luna Foundation were held custody of those funds, and so they were operating as effectively a, a bank managing the float for a coin. So you can argue it was algorithmic, but it wasn't really. It was, you know, it was, it was they had a me mechanism that didn't quite work. So um, I think that if you find a true algorithmic stable coin, which, um, which is where, where, you know, it's transparent in terms of what the reserves are. Like, it's kind of like what DAI is trying to do and, and UXD as well, you know, protocols. Like that stuff is probably fine and shouldn't be regulated because it's fully transparent and fully decentralized and there's no middleman controlling funds. Now, let's go to the other side of the equation, the asset-backed stable coins. So you've got things like Tether, uh, USDC, uh, which is Circle. You've got uh, Paxos has got one, et cetera, et cetera. These... These coins, as Sunny said, are supposed to be stable in value. But the stability comes from trust. So you have to trust the underlying counterparty holding those funds. So whether it's Circle and, and what they're holding it in. Are they holding it in US dollars? Is it short-term treasuries? Is it long-term treasuries? Um, what happens if those bonds drop? Like how much liquidity can they provide? Now it's basically acting as a bank. They issued you a digital token saying, I've got a dollar in the bank account that's, that's worth this much, and we will manage that. And so in the real world, if a bank goes under, you've got FDIC insurance, you've got a whole bunch of regulations. In, in the stablecoin world, you don't have that and people have to try. So, so I always say that you need regulations when something is not trustless. When something is trustless, regulations should not apply. And, and, and that's, for me, the key definition between when regulations should apply. Who am I trusting? And, and if there is someone to trust, then there should probably be regulations behind it. You know, that gets back to, Jason, your question just now about, like, why is there so much emotion around this and why is there so much heat? And it's because, you know, to your point, Vinny, like, that's an outstanding point. And what happened was a bunch of people got scared, like a bunch of scammers came, right? And a bunch of people yeah. just got stone cold robbed. And the, the scalpel work of figuring out who was a scammer and who was not is going to be painstaking. But trust overall, writ large as a philosophical question is is low right now. You However, also got the we should remember the internet started that way too, right? We did manage to scalpel our way into a functioning internet. You do have a ge geographic issue with like, you know, uh, Luna being offshore and, and, and Tether being offshore. And so yeah. how do you like, you know, how do you regulate these things, right? So, so I think the, the, the SEC's job and the US regular jobs to protect US consumers. So these coins that are sitting offshore should not be, uh, you know, like traded in the US. It, like, I don't think Tether should be, I don't think, um, you know, Luna should definitely not have not have been. I think that if you want to be, have access to US citizens, it should be in a regulated um, stable coin, like USDC or similar. Um, because now we're trusting, like, I mean, I have no faith in Tether. I don't think I've ever held Tether in my life. Like, I, now, I, I do think they probably have the money there, but I know for a fact at one point they did not have all the money. They were totally insolvent. They were underwater. They printed their way up. Bitcoin went on a run, whatever the case is. They're probably okay now. And people ask me, is Tether okay? Probably is the answer. Okay. Is Binance, B, you know, BUSD okay? Probably is the answer as well. So it doesn't mean it's always been the case. It doesn't mean it always will be the case. But my point is, I, I, there's no transparency, and I can't see it on chain. I can't see what the liabilities are. So even this whole proof of reserves thing that Binance is doing and the exchange is doing. It's, it's attestations. A of, it's a lot of crap. That's okay. anti-crypto. The whole point yeah. of crypto was just, I, you don't need to send me an accounting form. I look myself. So they're, they're non-crypto people. Mm -hmm. That's been the problem here is that these just, intermediaries just, I, are coming yeah. in and they're breaking the crypto rules which are yes. it's programmatic it's Trustless. transparent Trustless. yeah, yeah. But, uh, no, you, you, people don't appreciate yeah. what i tweeted about this a while ago but like 
Proof of reserves without proof of liabilities is meaningless. I can show you a bank account with $100 million in and yeah. you'll be like, Vinny's Vin, got $100 million cash in his account. That's amazing. If I, yeah. borrowed that, if I borrowed that from a bank and I don't yes. disclose my liabilities, I'm zero. Okay. <laughs> I literally was going to J trade Snap and I looked at Snapchat like, I don't know, six months ago, nine months ago. I was like, oh, they have $5 billion in cash. I was like, oh, this is great. And they're, and they're like only losing like a little bit. And then somebody's like, they got $5 billion in debt. I was like, wait, where's that? And I'm like, oh, the balance sheet. I'm like, oh, I got to read the balance sheet. It's like, yeah, you got to read the balance sheet, dummy. Yeah. <laughs> Molly, you were on air with me and we were like, huh, let's, let's break totally. this down. And yeah. like, it was and like we so like, much debt. I'm like, Ooh. I've never heard of a company that small having that much debt. Uh, and this and is they got to pay the that SEC back. Jason helped, took right? off they, the J Trade specs, put them down. Yeah. He backed away from the phone. <laughs> yeah. It was a no go. But, I was like, but yeah. this is where the SEC helped, right? Because they're forced to disclose that publicly, yes. right? They're forced Boom. every quarter to put that out there, right? Their balance sheet, their financials. And so you could go and understand that. Yeah. And you know what's really powerful about like using the definition, these definitions is that if the SEC said, look, if something is trustless, we're not going to touch it. That would be amazing mm. for the industry. That would actually spur more transparency. That would be ama- like, it's, it's, hmm. I think it's actually just net positive if we move to more trustless layers uh, across mm. DeFi, across everything. Um, the one area where I think needs um, a look is obviously, in, you know, my background here is identity, KYC, AML, those regulations, you can still do it trustlessly. Like Civic's got this technology. We, you, we can drop a pass in your wallet. We can verify your identity. No one needs to know who you are, but we can verify things about you. Uh, you're a citizen, not an uh, OFAC list, et cetera. Now you can use that wallet to transact. And this is practically trustless. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, a trustless type of solution. So distributed identity, uh, you know, decentralized identity, and, um, you know, just a hands-off approach, the more, de- the more uh, trustless your system is, will help crypto developers not take shortcuts. Because right now, it's really easy to do a shortcut. Let's just go partner with uh, Coinbase for staking. And let's go partner with this other company for staking. And let's like outsource all this stuff and let's spin up something very quickly. But you know, there's just too many counterparties and there's too many risks in the system. And so uh, m- my view is that the ACC should be a lot more um, aggressive with pushing people to trustlessness and transparency as opposed to trying to force regulations into the space. Well, here's my question, Sonny, to, to give the SEC the benefit of the doubt here. One of the things that we ironically have complained about, we being consumers and retail consumers and me and Jason on this show, is that the SEC has been slow to, to act. They've been very hands off mm-hmm. in this industry, which I think we can say is true. Now, the SEC is coming in and the CFTC is coming in and they're saying we are 100 percent cracking down on things that we classified as securities on staking pools on crappy financial tools that rip people off. There is, would you agree, no sign that the SEC or the CFTC are coming for the trustless aspects of this technology, the underlying the fundamentals? Yeah, I mean, it it seems that way. Like, again, just that video, I think, makes it very clear, right? It's not, they're not fundamentally coming after a blockchain. They're not saying, hey, you can't launch your own blockchain. And I think they are coming after the folks that have financialized it. And you can just Mm. see that in their actions. It's only the companies that um, kind of break Vinny's rule about being trustless that then require trust, right? And so they're, um, you know, right now we haven't seen them come after, say, Ave, right, Vinny, right? Which is like a a, a trustless borrowing network. And Mm -hmm. so... Um, you know, so, you don't see that in any of their listings or, or sushi swap or Uniswap or any, any of those type of, I have to say, um, right. this feels like about the right amount of time. Get it? Exactly. The it feels like it? the right amount of time. I, I know that our industry would like the, these agencies to work faster, but I I'm looking up online. BitUSD is claiming to be the first, uh, stable coin launched in 2014. These things became hit, you know, tether came after them, et cetera. And then like staking pools. What is that? Like. That was, I mean, proof of stake has been around since the beginning, right? That's 10 years, Vinny. I don't know what the first lending product was, but that's got to be five, well, six, seven yeah. years ago. Proof of stake, yeah, probably, probably 10. I mean, uh, Ethereum kind of pushed the envelope on that. So, and, but they only, what was the they, first they, they, lending? They, Do you remember the first time you heard of a lending? Like, hey, lend us your stuff. We'll give you some APY. We'll give you some extra tokens. What was the first one of those? 2017 uh, 2017 i think sunny okay so like these well, things the, take the, the, yeah there was, there was stuff like mastercoin 
and a few others, Factum, you know, a lot of the earlier blockchains play with instantiations of this, but they never really, it never really took off. I think like DeFi really took off in 20, 2018, really, like when we started like you know, a post bubble. So looking at this, uh, you know, my take on it is uh, original crypto technology was just and sound distributed without a lot of grifting in the in between. You get a bunch of grifters in who try to centralize it and take advantage of it. They're getting smacked down. Some of them are good actors. I believe Coinbase is a good actor. I believe Circle is a good actor. Other ones are not good actors. I believe Tether is a bad actor. I believe Luna was obviously a bad actor. We could all have our differences here uh, in terms of which ones you think are good actors, bad actors. And now the SEC and other agencies have to sort through this mess in Meshuggah. It's going to take them a little bit of time. Uh, should they have moved faster? I guess. Should people have played by the rules a little bit better? Of course. And uh, here we are. I think we're we're close to having a framework. I don't think we need a new agency, Vinny. I think the new the existing agencies have to learn the new tricks, and and we're close. But I do think people like Circle, uh, and Jeremy Allaire and Brian Armstrong should be invited. They should be, um, I don't know, engaged civilly and seriously by the SEC and these organizations because I believe they are good actors and they're trying to do it right. Uh, but they should also not have their employees front running. And this is where I was like, hey, Brian, you know, don't tell me I'm getting duped. When your own employees are being convicted of front running or employee, I don't know if it's multiple at this point, but we can pull up that tweet or you can pull up the actual story. You kind of, you know, these, these crypto companies have pe employees front running the market, knowing when things are going to get listed on Coinbase. But just a defense here, Jake. Oh, that's like, could be just a bad actor within the business. Of course, right? it's a bad that, actor. It wasn't, yes. yeah, it wasn't a design of could happen Coinbase anywhere. To do that. Yeah, but exactly. I think, like, yeah. then going, Definitely this is nuts. back to the arrogance we're talking about to go after people and tell them they're getting duped. For Brian Armstrong to tell me I'm getting duped is just insulting. You know, I mean, to, to look, let's just be a little bit more balanced here, right? There, there are bad actors and good actors in this industry. and, and there's probably In all industries. In, yeah, in all industries. And there's probably more bad actors than good in crypto. Boiler room. Of, it's a great boiler room. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you're not wrong. I mean, you're not wrong when you say that most of, guys. Most, of, <laughs> most, of crypto is a, most of crypto is a grift. Like, most of it is a grift. Uh, especially, especially the you stuff You feel from, that way. Yeah, I feel okay. that way. So you're disappointed I, I, in it. But and you're fun against yeah. it. But also even within traditional finance, Vinny, right? Like yeah. to this yeah. to this day yes. right now, and I I, I don't have oh, it handy with I me. wouldn't say most the, though. I wouldn't say most no, in venture no, no, capital is a grip. No, no, no. Not I'm not saying that. No, I'm we're saying talking even about finance. within a, a, a you know, uh. hugely regulated um framework, there's this public company which is like a sandwich shop out of New Jersey. Did you have you guys seen this? Oh yes, I yeah. remember yeah. that. Yeah, this is a publicly <laughs> listed company, like on like uh, the Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange. We can maybe pull it up as we're doing it here. Yeah, it is insane. That thing made it all the way through, and it's like a sandwich shop. And so this this type of stuff is occurring everywhere. It's not just limited to crypto, right? You, um, this is and, unbelievable. This story. And there's a <laughs> yeah. bunch of money to be made grifters are going to come in and there was a They're lot of money in, to be yeah. made in crypto and a lot of grifters came in but Father. like i'm going to take the really unpopular opinion here <laughs> okay. that i actually think gary gensler gets it i think he 100 huh. percent gets it and i think he waited until the grifting was you know too big to Out ignore <laughs> until there was yeah but until yeah. there was until there was enough delineation right like yeah. i do not believe he is coming in trying to nuke all of crypto i no. think he is attempting a scalpel move here and it might be tough and you can mm. debate the timing of it, but like the fact is, like I, I see no sign that he that he and the SEC at this exact moment don't understand what they're doing here. What they let's seem to be saying is second. this financialization is BS. And now let's talk about sandwiches. Well, yeah, I just <laughs> I, I can't leave the audience hanging. <laughs> Three men charged with fraud in hundred million dollar New Jersey deli scheme. This is why I'm the world's greatest <laughs> moderator because when I hear something that's just he's so like uh -uh, incredible, no. I have to stop the show. I just. <laughs> Just recap it, folks. Three men were charged in various crimes, including the CNBC, uh, including securities fraud in a scheme involving a small town, New Jersey Deli. Your hometown deli, that's the name of the deli, was operated under an umbrella company called Hometown International. You put the international there, it makes it more formal. It became right. known as a hundred million dollar deli, reflecting its owner's bizarrely huge market value. James Patton, Peter Cook Sr., and Peter Cook Jr. 
never trust people with a senior and junior there with the same name. Uh, Cooker, I'm sorry, face stiff prison sentences and fines for allegedly manipulating markets and defrauding investors. The, m- the men were charged with fraud uh, involving a company that was worth $100 million in the stock market, despite only having a small town, New Jersey deli. It's incredible. This is where you this is where you only ever trust Matt Levine on these topics, because Matt Levine frequently, constantly in his newsletter is like everything is securities fraud. Like this is the just important part comes no. down to whether you get busted or not. The deli lauded for its cheesesteaks and Italian subs had under 40,000 in annual revenue closed earlier this year. And they were company. filing they were filing 10 Q's and all the, the stuff. Right. And yeah. so people they were doing it all right. Want it. Yeah. So uh, this is incredible. I mean, um, it's only it's only fraud. It's only fraud because a bank didn't start it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Whew. Good show, guys. I think we ultimately agree. I think we've landed on. Yeah, we, we agree. That's a great video. I gotta. I, I'll grab that. That's a good one to share. I think as well. When you we put up, it really kind of just brought everyone that together. Video, by the way, has four and a half million views. Like it tells you how hungry people are for, for uh, a, yeah. a real conversation, like a back and forth about this. You guys want to see the manager? People actually understand it. You guys want to see the manager of this? This deli? is why Jason's the most yeah. ADHD moderator. Yeah, and this is uh, <laughs> please pull it this up. This is an incredible Please. manager of bring him uh, up. Bring the him father up. son deli charging it. There he is. Uh huh. This is <laughs> oh, There's your manager. There's a manager. He, he, he looks like a, a pro man, Steven Seagal. <laughs> you gotta be on your cap. Hey, <laughs> I showed a picture of Furio from the yeah, Sopranos. It's, Sopranos. A, it's a deep pull. Yeah. Yeah. Furio was. For, I mean, just look it up, folks. If you haven't seen the Sopranos, I have a. I, I have a prediction about uh, TikTok. Okay. What? What? I okay. Just, I'm floating it right now. And I'm like, where are we going? I think it's done. And it's going to get sold this year. It's going to get liquidated. And I don't think it can be bought by one of the fangs, uh, but I do think it could merge with another player that's smaller, that's under, you know, like under $50 million, $50 billion company could potentially um, merge with it or whatever to get shareholder value, kind of back it into a, a company here, or they could acquire another company. But I think, given the balloon situation, again? <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm like, you <laughs> mean maybe your... one with like about <laughs> $3.7 billion I, in debt? I think Google <laughs> and Microsoft could have been the people to buy it reasonably. Obviously, Facebook wouldn't be allowed. But th- those would be perfect buyers of it. I also think like, you know, if a Disney or somebody, an entertainment company wanted to get more video views from consumers, I think that could work too. But I think they have a hard time managing it. But I think any company that is under $50 billion, that already has a social media product up and running could merge with it. I have no inside information. But I think if you spun out TikTok and it was worth 250 billion and you had a company that was worth under 50 billion, you put it with it, you could have a pretty powerful public entity that would solve all of these China problems and all the people would get the Chinese government, Chinese investors, the US investors would all get their money out. What do you guys think about my conspiracy theory slash well, I don't think it's first. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go Snapchat. I Any love social network under fifty billion. I mean, I, I see where you're going with this. Like just to be clear. Just to be clear. I have no I'm, inside information. I just want to be clear. <laughs> so I'm don't... picking up what you were what you're laying down. <laughs> and if in fact you were said hmm. network and perhaps you had had a short video service that you uh inadvisedly killed not so long possible. ago, anything it's... is possible. I think this would be like an incredible move. And by you already have alliteration, Twit Talk. I'm just saying. <laughs> Twit Talk. I think it would be <laughs> like really interesting if like a Twitter or a if a Twitter or a Snap. I don't know if there's anybody else who's in consumer that has a public entity already that this could be boom, right on the market. Mm-hmm. It would be worth five hundred billion immediately. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Four hundred billion, three hundred billion. Let's billion. go! Incredible. I like I, 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 I gotta like run it. soon, guys. So okay. we should probably anyway, run fast. And he's like, I only want to talk about crypto. You guys anyway. have no reactions. All right, nah. listen. <laughs> Sandeep, thank you. you, you Vinny, you know something that we don't, Jake House. I don't. I, that literally <laughs> gave three disclaimers there. Um, I think Snap's the the logical place. You got great founder. Got a yep. good uh, CEO. Get co CEOs going. You got the two of them. You immediately have scale. Boom! Snap. You just get to work. All right, everybody.
Molly Rock. What a peaceful, <laughs> what a peaceful show. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Vinny <laughs> Lingham, Thanks. Sunny Mandra. Thank you. Thank you. As always, uh, we will be following 2023, the year of this careful, careful surgery. Yeah. Love it. All right. We got it. Thanks, See you guys. next time. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. You know we're not gonna leave you hanging in the OK Boomer department. And Rachel reporting is here. Who do you have? I love these. I love these. They're so interesting. I'm super excited because this week we have my friend Prince Ghosh on. He is the co-founder and CEO of Factored Quality. I've known Prince for a while. And that is because the company that I worked for before this week in startups invested in them. But even then, um, I did know Prince too well. And when I moved to New York, I got coffee with him and I put two and two together. And he made a rebrand, changed his company's name, um, and they pivoted from when I was working at the first company. So I totally didn't know until we got coffee. And I got to learn about factor quality. And right away, I was like, wait, this company's sick. I have to have you on OK Boomer. Crazy that I've known him for this long um, and didn't have him on. But basically, factor quality offers software and managed services to help book trained quality control inspectors globally to inspect goods. Okay. And the entire quality assurance field basically is insane. It's super fractured. It's um, really, really hard to do globally, especially. And with, as we can see, um, CPG is getting a lot harder to do. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want things to be super organized, super great. Prince explains this a lot better than I do. Um, but he himself has a really interesting path to becoming a, a founder in general, especially kind of in a field that you wouldn't think a 20 something would be necessarily super interested in. Um, he found out about really the opportunities to innovate within quality assurance um, because he used to work at NASA while he was in college and for a little bit afterwards. And what? then I know he's <laughs> so smart. He's so cool. He explains the manufacturing industry really well. And yeah, super pumped to have our first OK Boomer guest um, within the manufacturing industry. I think it's a super important place to be um, to be innovating in right now. And I wish him all the best. I hope you guys enjoy. That's so fascinating. All right. Here it is. Thank you so much, Prince, for being on today's episode of This Week in Startups. Um, this is the OK Boomer segment where I talk to young founders, investors, and creators. And I've had the pleasure of meeting you in person before. Those are my favorite kinds of recordings to do is once I've already talked to the person before um, face to face. So again, Prince from Factored Quality. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Prince, you are the co-founder and CEO of Factored Quality which is not a super sexy business. I talk to a lot of people, I feel like in consumer, um, I actually, I, I know you very, I feel like through several ways, which I think is interesting. Like number one, I feel like I've met you just through like the New York tech ecosystem. But sure. I've also met you because some of my favorite investors over at Dynamo, which is where I did my fellowship for venture capital, they invested in you and they're That's super right. uh, interested in supply chain and mobility companies. Um, so that was awesome. So I know you through two ways. Um, again, quality assurance, not a super sexy industry. Can you kind of explain what factor quality does and why quality assurance in general is like an industry you're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm so glad that we could get to do this. So at a high level, Rachel, uh, factored quality helps consumer goods brands across the world run quality control, testing and compliance on their global supply chains. So the part that we really play into is kind of in this hidden backend ecosystem of how products get made. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about companies like Flexport on the freight forwarding yeah. bit and you know stored on the uh, last mile fulfillment bit. Um, where we kind of plan to is one step between before even both of those. So we are specifically really interested in the process of how get products get made, how factories are found to source these products, and how do we ensure that brands can manufacture and procure high quality uh, products that they send to end customers like you and I all over the world. So the way it specifically works is Factored Quality is a software plus technology enabled services ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, we have a piece of software where brands go in and they basically tell us, hey, uh, I'm manufacturing this product and I'm looking to import it into the US and sell it at these retailers. And we help them create quality control compliance or testing checklists to make sure that they're abiding by quality control or compliance or testing standards. Um, yeah. And then... We have an entire network of people who are trained and vetted quality control inspectors, so actual humans who go down to these factory floors all over the world in China and in India and in Europe and really anywhere that companies manufacture goods 
who actually are going down to these factory floors, running through these checklists, overseeing production, and actually inspecting these goods. So our kind of North Star vision is to, you know, kind of ask the question, how can we make it as easy for a brand to find a factory to partner with anywhere in the world, and then start working with them and scale up their production without ever having to compromise on the quality of the product? and without having to go out and fly out to these factories themselves. So that's kind of where we fit in. I do have a question. So you kind of talked a little bit about, obviously, you guys are a global company. Um, People are doing quality assurance everywhere. How are you training these people um, if it's global? Is this something that like there's already like country by country there? There's like a test these people can be taking. um, Or is this something like a separate course you guys have to teach people to become um, the people that are actually going in and doing those human quality assurance reviews? Yeah, great question. So in the past, most brands did kind of one of three things. If they were, if you were a brand in the US, um, say you were a skincare cos- or a cosmetics brand, and you were manufacturing in China, you would really do one of three options. You would either set up a team locally on the ground near your factory, or you would be flying out to your factory for most production runs to oversee the production runs and like actually look at the goods yourself. Or you would try and find a third party trained and vetted quality control inspector in that region. So this entire category of quality control inspectors is one that already exists. If if you Google today, like quality control inspections Shenzhen, you would come up with a list of 150 quality control inspection agencies and firms. And then there's a few multinational conglomerates or labs that also have uh, these trained and vetted inspectors. Yeah. What we've basically done is gone out and built up long-term partnerships and relationships with all of those different inspection agencies and firms. So where we specifically fit is right in between with the brands on one end and with these inspectors on the other. And we think of ourselves almost like a digital broker, or like a digital platform that sits in between those two sides of the equation. Got you. And um, you mentioned another company, you mentioned Sword, which is actually also founded by a Gen Z founder around both of our ages, uh, Sean Henry, which is crazy to think about both of you kind of in this in this realm of things and being around my age, because I never think about quality assurance necessarily. This wouldn't have been a business that I was exposed to and thinking I could innovate in. Um, what really inspired you to go down this path? Yeah, absolutely. And if, you know, for what it's worth, Sean and Stuart are uh, inspirations to me and Killing I mean to us. And, yeah, just amazing people and an yeah. amazing company. Um, the Atlanta, Atlanta-based founder too, which is kind of cool. Based, Atlanta-based yeah. founder. And it's funny, we actually have a number of mutual customers and we're trying no to way. figure out ways to also work together. Yeah, yeah. And um, Stuart so, is uh, another Dynamo portfolio company, I think, right? <laughs> that is true. Yeah. yeah. The, the okay. connections are endless. Yeah. Um, very cool. So I think Sean, if I'm not mistaken, he got his start uh, working in automotive parts uh, manufacturing. Yes. So it's funny, I kind of also came from a similar direction. What I found is usually when there's folks on the younger end who are kind of, you know, entrenched in some of these B2B or enterprise industries, we usually come from like the customer side of the equation and have had some experience there that made us think, hey, there could be a better way. So for me personally, um, I went to school in Cleveland, Ohio, I went to Case Western, I studied mechanical and aerospace engineering there. And I thought I was going to be an aerospace engineer for the rest of my life. Um, And I started out initially working for NASA uh, has a research center in the Cleveland area and a number of you know, suppliers and contract manufacturers in that region. So I was working in the kind of defense and aerospace ecosystem over there. Um, and I Is ended this up, while you were in college or were you graduated at this point? This was like right towards the tail end of college, um, yep. towards my senior year of college, tail end, and then shortly thereafter. Um, and so I was kind of working with NASA and I ended up getting pulled into a project where we were basically going through uh, our supplier qualifications and basically saying, hey, Look, we are manufacturing parts that are going to fly into space. These are kind of as critical from a quality or a compliance standpoint as they come. And we found ourselves unable to answer sometimes simple questions of like, can we actually work with these manufacturers that we're already working with? And do they have the right documentation and quality control standards and compliance standards in place? So I ended up working on a team on a couple of projects where we were trying to digitize a lot of these old enterprise ERP systems that we had um, and build in this intelligent layer. And I just remember thinking like, how crazy it was that, you know, these systems that we use to store and manage all of our information in these enterprises aren't actually intelligent and can't tell us the and can't answer these questions about our supply chain. So um, I left there and started a company called Workbench, uh, which was building really a pure software layer um, to kind of do what we're doing now. Uh, We were almost like a modern ERP or a modern quality management system in certain ways. Um, And through that process, took that company through Y Combinator, uh, grew it a little bit. That was actually where I first met the Dynamo team. Yep. And Just we, say, I, knew you, I feel like I've heard of you when you were at Workbench too. So this is cool. Exactly. Yeah. And it, through Workbench, we had the fortune of meeting a really cool team right here in New York called Doris Dev. 
So Doris Dev was is a product development and supply chain management agency. Um, so they run supply chains for hundreds of consumer goods brands. So we were building supply chain management software. They were running supply chains for a bunch of these consumer goods brands. They've actually incubated one of their own brands. If you can kind of see in the back here, a D2C humidifier company called oh. uh, Canopy. Yeah, it was spun out of Doris Dev. So cool. we started working closely with their team. And at some point yeah. we realized, hey, we can actually bring what we've built from the software layer together with what they've built from this managed services standpoint um, and kind of build something that was at the intersection of the two. So not just serve as a system of record or a pure piece of software, but also help these brands actually run supply chain oversight, factory sourcing, quality control, um, and production management. And that yep. was kind of the genesis of what led to factored quality. So that's the story here. So Doris Dev too, let's touch on them. So sure. I'm a huge fan of Doris Dev. Um, if you listen to this, we can start up to probably already know of um, some companies they work with because we have spoken to the um, the people over at Magic Spoon, I believe yeah. twice on this podcast now. Yep. That's a customer. And my favorite customer of Doris Dev is, and I believe they are still a customer, is Mischief, yep. which is like our collective that comes out with stuff. So Doris Dev, if anybody's listening, really interesting. And by the way, ERP systems um, are something in tech. If you're really interested in this like supply chain world, definitely something to look into because it seems like everyone's trying to innovate basically erp systems um enterprise resource management i think is what it stands for freaking no one's happy nobody's happy with an erp system um so it's awesome that you were able to kind of um like pivot over to factor quality i feel like that is like such a great great way to um to share your skills and really really hone in on that and is it difficult and i want to go again i my first question to you was about, I believe, a global team. I have to ask you again about having um, doing quality assurance globally because I feel like that it would just be, especially now with Gen Z consumers, people mm -hmm. are really critical on um, where their products are coming from, if mm -hmm. they're being uh, produced in like ethical factories, anything like that. Have you noticed any shifts generationally with quality assurance, or is this really just on a buyer side? Yeah, I, especially I think, globally too. Uh, no, it's it's a great question. I think there's two parts to the answer. I think one part is what we're seeing from an end buyer side, right? So people like you and I and, you know, kind of the preferences that we have for the brands that we buy from. Um, and I think it was, you know, companies like Everlane that really first yeah. pioneered this model of like, hey, let's actually show the end consumer how their product is being made. Like, where is, you know, the money being added on? Um, and who are the actual factories that are involved in this entire production process? And what we're seeing more and more is people truly do care about the fact that their products are being made. And you know, high quality factories that treat their employees well, that don't have child labor, that have ethical working conditions and uh, have environmental compliance standards in place. So I think that's one half of the equation, Rachel. Um, I think the other half and one of the big kind of impetuses that, you know, led us to starting factored quality was we sort of noticed this really big macroeconomic shift on the back of the last couple of years. Um, and a lot of the challenges that have been happening at a geopolitical scale with shipping logistics, um, with tariffs, uh, with the ability for companies to be able to source and manufacture products in certain regions of the world. And what we realized was the brand that yesterday was manufacturing products just in, say, China, today is probably wow. sourcing from factories in Vietnam and Mexico and Canada and India and Pakistan and yeah. all these other regions. And what we realized was it didn't make sense for a world in the future for these brands to build up teams or fly out to all of these different countries, every single production run, we really started Factored Quality to serve as these companies' eyes and ears on the ground at their local supply chains on behalf of them so that they didn't have to incur these costs themselves, but could gotcha. still source and do business with whoever they wanted from uh, all across the world. So those are kind of the two parts to my answer. And how many people are currently on your team? Um, no, I'm not talking about people that are just uh, the people actually doing the quality insurance. Um, but as your team right now, how big are you guys? Yeah, our core team is about 15, um, 12 of us, and then a couple of folks are in contract. And we're spread out th uh, throughout the US, um, Europe, and we also have a team in Hong Kong. Got you. And how difficult do you think it is to do a business like this on those are time zones that are pretty crazy? And I feel like quality assurance is one of those things where if there's an issue, it's a pretty time sensitive issue. How do you deal with that while being such a, a team that is so spread out? Yeah, it's it's not easy for sure. Um, and there's definitely a degree of complexity to this business. But I mean, I think if you would speak to Sean at Stored or if you would speak to the Flexport team or anyone else there, the the kind of our our you know pitch and kind of the, the line we draw on the sand is saying, 
look, these businesses are complex, but they're worth building, right? Because they truly yeah. solve a problem that people have and that the world needs. And yeah, there's times where like, it's hard for us to, you know, schedule even an all hands and get everyone together at the mm-hmm. same place, same time. Yeah. But it's the consequence of manufacturing truly being a global effort, right? Manufacturing doesn't just happen in one region. It's kind of the true origins of trade and, of you know, how the modern economy was formed. Um, and us having a global team and kind of being, you know, distributed first is just a function to fit into this ecosystem that we're playing into. Awesome. And if you were going to change something about um, manufacturing in America, or I guess give me one prediction that we're going to be seeing within the next five years, what is one trend um, that you predict is really going to take off here? Yeah. um, In America, not globally. Yeah, great question. Um, I think what we are starting to see is, at least in certain product industries, some degrees of final assembly and production being done in the US. So even if brands are necessarily like sourcing their raw materials or their individual components, right, from suppliers internationally, um, we have seen some degree of a trend of people doing the final assembly and then that last mile fulfillment and storage, of course, um, at warehouses and distribution centers here in the US. And I think we'll see more of that. There's a couple of really cool companies um, that are building really cool advancements in uh, also different manufacturing processes. So you and I, we both know Austin Bishop, uh, who is one of the co-founders yep. of Atomic. Um, and Austin and I, we went to college in the same place and his co-founder at Atomic, Aaron, still runs a company. And um, Atomic is doing something like incredibly interesting in the yep. injection molding space and trying to make it easy for us to build up injection molding capacity here in the US. So. Um, lots of cool companies that are building a lot of this infrastructural advancement. But yeah, I think that's what we'll start to see more of. Fun fact, my dad said um, if he wasn't doing his current job, and by the way, he, he still works in logistics, okay. he would have started an injection, an injecting molding company and focusing on farm equipment. So there you go. Um, yeah, obviously, <laughs> this has been a this is even an issue that uh, people um, that have been in the industry, I guess, the logistics industry a very long time are seeing. So thank you so totally. much, Brent, for coming on. Um, what was the article um, that came out? What was the title of it? Um, if people are interested in reading up about uh, you and Austin, because I know you guys had a piece um, that came out together and it was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Austin and I, we recently co-authored a piece for Forbes uh, about a month or so ago, um, talking about this kind of new wave of decentralization that we're seeing in yeah. manufacturing. I think a lot of the kind of two uh, rhetorics that have been you know talked about a lot in regards to manufacturing is, on one end of the spectrum, everything is coming back to the US. And then on the other end of the spectrum, everything is staying in China and staying, you know, uh, overseas <laughs> and is not going to come back to the US. And the sort of, let's call it like a prophecy or hypothesis of where the world is going, in our opinion, is it's really not as simple as that. And what we'll actually see is this kind of true decentralization of manufacturing. Um, and yeah. we'll see bits and pieces of some types of manufacturing going to Latin America or going to South America or going to Europe or India. And then we'll see other pieces of manufacturing that continue to stay in China. I I think um, the Ryan Peterson from Flexport, uh, he was on a on a news source recently and said, like, from for their data, the US has actually done more trade than ever with China across certain product categories. And Hmm. we've seen the same on the manufacturing front. So it's a it's a very intricate and nuanced world that we live in, right? And it's not so simple as like all manufacturing comes back or all manufacturing stays overseas. Um, Again, part of the reason that we built factor quality is to be able to give brands the ability to manufacture where they want to anywhere in the world they want to but still feel like they have that degree of trust and visibility on what's actually happening on their production lines and on their supply chains without having to be in all those different regions so that's yeah well awesome thank you so much prince uh, for joining me today on okay boomer this is a really interesting discussion definitely one that's a lot different than uh what we typically have and if people want to find you on the internet and ask you more questions where can they find you yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter, find me on LinkedIn, or just go to factoredquality.com and send us a note there. Great. Thanks, Prince. Amazing. Thanks, Rachel. Take care. And that is a wrap on the week, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with more news and another great episode of Angel. I hope you have an awesome weekend. See you Monday. Bye-bye. <laughs>